So this is the Artificially Intelligent Podcast. My name is Ricky. This is Matt. We are a podcast for entrepreneurial engineers to teach you about AI as we explore AI. Do you want to introduce yourself, Matt? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I'm currently a lead engineer at a company called Morning Brew. Uh, in a past life, I was uh, an entrepreneur, had a couple businesses mostly fail, uh, but in college I started one that was semi-successful. I was able to sell for a very small amount of money, uh, and I eventually dropped out of college, and I kind of launched my engineering career. So that's where I'm at today. Very cool. Yeah. So I also started several uh, failed companies in high school and college. <laughs> Who among um, us hasn't, right? <laughs> ended up uh, thinking I was going to be an academic, went to grad school for math, worked at a couple national labs, uh, worked on some projects ranging from provable uh, cybersecurity properties of some different machine learning algorithms. Um, to some biotech uh, AI stuff, to some quantum computing algorithms uh, before I eventually dropped out of grad school to join a legal tech startup and then left there to start an asset management company, which is where I work now. And now we're also starting this podcast. In other words, he's incredibly smart. <laughs> <laughs> so, But uh, I didn't uh, sell my company in college. That Listen, just it was <laughs> thousands of dollars. <laughs> when I say small, it was small. Um, but yeah, that did give me some of the skills uh, that I was able to use elsewhere. But enough of that. Um, so we want to talk about AI today. And specifically, we want to talk about ChatGPT plugins, because that was announced this past week. And it's, uh, it's a pretty interesting development, I think. You finally have the ability to tie ChatGPT into third-party services, yep. get updated information, and I'm excited to see what things we can do with that. Yeah, and so I actually had a list of questions for you. Um, we did dive into the documentation a little bit. We, we tested, uh, or we looked at some of their examples, right? And uh, we just want to see exactly like what's possible now, what uh, native plugins there are, and, and what you know might come down the line. So. Um, is it okay if I ask you a couple questions, Ricky? Yeah, maybe, to... maybe we should start with just a quick like what the ChatGPT plugins are. Yeah. So I think like a plugin is basically an app for ChatGPT. Um, it is an API with a manifest file that is a brief description of sort of the basic name, logo, uh, description, authentication um, details for your API. Um, but yeah, it's basically an API that you give to ChatGPT, you register with OpenAI, and it gives you the ability to access up-to-date information or um, perform actions through third-party services. So that's the basics of what we're going to talk about today. Okay, so I'm looking at the ChatGPT plugins and, and some of the companies that have integrated with them today. Uh, companies like Expedia, Instacart, Kayak, OpenTable. They even have one for uh, Wolfram Alpha, which I know you work with a lot. So. The Wolfram Alpha one is pretty interesting. I took a look at how that works, and basically you, a user puts in a ChatGPT prompt. Um, that then gets translated into a Wolfram Alpha prompt, which is passed to Wolfram Alpha via API. Wolfram Alpha then runs the computation based on that prompt, generates a Wolfram Alpha output. That Wolfram Alpha output gets passed back to ChatGPT. ChatGPT then translates that into GPT speak. Hmm. So someone who doesn't really work with like very complex mathematical equations, uh, I'm definitely a layman in that regard. So when I think of that, I'm like, oh, can ChatGPT already make certain like calculations? I would expect most of the math that I would have put into ChatGPT today, I would be able to do. So I guess, can you maybe go a little bit deeper into the depth of of why this like yeah, you might you, you so might have to keep me out of the the ultra depths. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with that. Yeah. So I, I can give you an example. So um, the last project that I worked on before leaving grad school, yeah, I was working with some biochemists, and I was building models on um, the set of rotations. So this is very abstract, but if you are if you ever work with like um, CAD programs or anything that is like a very geometrical program. I failed geometry, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Basically, you have, um, you know, you have sort of these like high dimensional spaces or, or like, let's say, you know, just let's say three dimensional space here, okay. right? There is a set that represents the set of rotations of three dimensional space. And that is a very non-intuitive thing. It's not yeah. a space that we live in. It's a purely mathematical space, but you can define functions on that space. And for example, if you define a probability distribution on that space, it is a probability distribution over rotation. So let's say I want to do a random rotation of three-dimensional space. Okay. 
I could sample a probability distribution, maybe it's uniform, maybe it's not, that gives me some random rotation of three-dimensional space. And that might be useful for maybe I'm you know, conducting a physics simulation, maybe I'm doing something like, uh, maybe I'm doing data analysis, maybe I am you know, dealing with proteins, um, maybe I'm just rendering, and yeah. as part of my rendering algorithm, I need to do random three-dimensional rotations and then do some kind of ray tracing or something like that. Yeah, that, that was what I had, had, when you said the cat example, I was thinking, you know, you have some object, you're able to kind of rotate around it, and there are, I guess, certain points or, um, you know, data calculations you need to make on that to kind of facilitate that process, right? Or, yeah, so like I would say, in, you know, let's go back to like me as grad student, right? Yeah. Like if I was doing anything um, with, you know, sort of that set of math, um, I use Wolfram Alpha a lot, mm -hmm. and you can ask it to compute things about certain probability distributions on um, that, that set of rotations. And that's a very good example of, you know, I, I tried running the same sorts of questions, and, and ChatGPT essentially knows nothing about them. Like, it, it knows yeah. sometimes what the probability distributions are by name, but it has no idea what they are mathematically, and it has no idea how to work with them. <laughs> so if you wanted to ask ChatGPT, you know, something like that, um, the Wolfram Alpha plugin definitely would enhance its ability to do so. So I think the Wolfram Alpha plugin, at minimum, makes it uh, more useful to scientists and mathematicians. Yeah. Um, and in addition, Wolfram Alpha has a lot of data that's not just for people who are really in-depth nerds. Like yeah. it also has a lot of like interesting widgets to calculate different things. Um, and you know, ChatGPT is pretty good at basic math, but it is not perfect by any means. And so. Yeah, Wolf, especially if there's multiple steps involved, um, Wolfram Alpha, I'd say, is much more reliable. So, in other words, with these plugins, ChatGPT is getting better and better by the day. How long until I'm out of a job as a as a software engineer? <laughs> yeah, it's a it's, it's a good coming, question. It's <laughs> yeah, there was a really interesting study um, that I looked at actually by OpenAI, which they did an analysis of like what jobs they thought were more, most susceptible. I saw to, this too, and that was near the top, right? Yeah, it, I, <laughs> unfortunately, I that, it was very interesting though yeah. because you know, so in this study, they basically took um, over a thousand different types of jobs. Um, there, you know, it's a government agency called the Bureau of Labor Statistics that does a detailed analysis of like the types of tasks that are involved in each type of job. Mm -hmm. And so they took all of these different tasks, had both humans and um, AI, so they had chat GPT itself and humans rate the tasks based on how much exposure they had to GPT. In other words, how easy would it be for ChatGPT to do, I think it was at least 50% of this task. Okay. And so then they added up all the tasks for each of those 1,000 plus jobs and then ranked them based on both AI and human ratings of how uh, much they thought a GPT or a GPT-like AI could replace a human on those, type, on those jobs. Mm -hmm. And so the ones that were at the very top were, yeah, things like programming um, and you know, also, interestingly, you know, it said mathematician. That was one of the ones that uh, AI, I think, yeah. I think it was GPT that ranked mathematician as a 100% replaceable job. Wow. So that, that to me made me question the study a little bit because I don't think, uh, I don't think AI, I don't think GPT quite knows what a mathematician does. I think a lot of people have the impression that a mathematician adds up big numbers <laughs> yeah. and doesn't Wait, realize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't like uh, think about that they might be working with these, you know, the three-dimensional set of rotations. Yeah. Um, and GPT is not, even GPT-4 is not that good, good at, at that yet. Okay. Um, so I would say, yeah, take the, take the study with a grain of salt. But it did rank, you know, sort of software engineering programming uh, at, with a very high exposure. Um, but also it ranked scientific fields or fields that required a lot of critical thinking um, with negative correlation. So it actually, uh, the study was basically claiming that, you know, if you're doing the type of programming this is my interpretation anyway, the study was basically saying if you're doing the type of programming that is very rudimentary, if you're, or if you're solving problems that other people have already solved, which yeah. is a lot of programming, yeah. right, then you're at moderately higher risk. But if you are doing the type of programming where you are solving novel problems that are, you know, sort of new, um, you know, you're developing new types of algorithms, new types of software, um, and it's not too similar to things that have been done before, then I think you're pretty safe. Yeah, I, I'm kind of of the mindset that uh, most jobs will change. So like something like software engineering, it's not going to look like it does today, you know, maybe even like three to five years down the line. Will it be completely replaced? I 
I hope not. Uh, but I, I, I do think that uh, my job title and, and day to day will definitely change, and I'll be seeing a lot more uh, ChatGPT like um, you know features and, and softwares that I'll be using day to day. I think engineers especially will probably turn more to, towards like the project manager side of things where you know, you're taking um, direction and you're, you're, you're kind of facilitating that process of taking those directions, making them technical, and then uh, hopefully implementing it. I, you know, I don't know that ChatGPT will get there that soon, but that might be wishful thinking on my end. I think you're right. I think the, uh, like the ability to like discern the requirements for a task is going to be super yeah. important. Because, and that's always been the case as an engineer. You know? Yeah. But I think, I think right now, you know, you can get away from that a little bit because you have that abstraction between like the project manager and then like right. you're assigned a very specific type of thing. Um, I think you're right in that that hierarchy will probably collapse a bit because some of those rudimentary tasks will be more easily automatable. And right. so you'll have to be, you know, like one of the fundamental values I think that humans will continue to bring for at least, you know, the foreseeable five to 10 years even, um, is that, you know, the idea of an AGI is yeah. like a general intelligence, um, you know, sort of the, the mantra of like anything you can do, it can do better. I don't think that, you know, I think to be able to really do that, um, in the end, all products are intended for human use. Goods and services, economic output is intended for human use. So you're valuing it as a human. Yep. And AI does not currently share the ability to experience the same emotional response that a human does. Mm -hmm. um, they can read about it. You know, like, chat, like GPT reads and it knows... It's actually feel it is a different thing, right? Exactly. Yeah. It has to either feel it or it needs to observe it sufficiently well. So I think to observe it sufficiently well would be, you know, if you, we have robots that can interact with humans on a day-to-day -day basis and interact and, you know, match up the semantics of language, you know, what it reads with the real-life semantics of the world, then it can understand what human emotions are and, and what humans want. And then it can develop something that, you know, a product that a human actually finds useful. Otherwise it has to just guess and, and, you know, guesses can be inaccurate. This is the same problem. It's like, you know, if you're, uh, um, if you run a programming agency, a software development agency and some client brings you and says, I want this, you know, this bit of, uh, this kind of website, this kind of app yeah. and you develop it for them. And they're like, well, it's not quite what I wanted, right? You have to understand, what their needs are better than they do. Yeah. Um, and I don't think AI will understand their needs better than they do because Thanks. AI has never experienced those frustrations. Right. So AI would take their thing and just generate exactly, you know, sort of the naive approach, the same as like a naive software development agency versus really understanding what they want and what they need and then like building that in. Yeah. So I think that will continue. I think that's probably one of the strongest moats is a, a job right? Like if you want to protect your job, if you're in that kind of role where you can understand like what the human requirements are, um, the sort of non-obvious human requirements, I think that's a good job protector for engineers. Yeah. That's a really interesting like thought experiment. And I do want to get back on the topic of uh, GPT plugins in a second, but I did kind of want to go back towards the AGI discussion. So uh, uh, when we do eventually get to that point, do you think that the flywheel is going to be so strong with that particular AI that it becomes like the AI to rule them all? Or do you think that there's like space for, you know, multiple different AIs uh, able to help in like different areas of life? Like, how do you see that working? Because I tend to think that it will be able to kind of train itself and, and that flywheel will just kind of keep going and, and maybe it expands to kind of be the, you know, the AI. I think there will probably be a mix of both. Yeah. I think um, there will be a flywheel constrained by the same sort of thing that I was talking about a minute ago, which is that uh, you, AGI is not well defined, right? So like the term like air artificial, like general intelligence, um, general with respect to what domain. Mm. So if it's with respect to the domain of humans, like I want to be able to interact, like let's say I want to train an, uh, an AI to be a uh, master negotiator. Uh, I don't think, I think it can be very good at it, but I don't think it will surpass the best human until it has access to enough training data that is real world interactions with right. humans. So I think it will have to be put into service as a negotiator or, you know, run as, you know, part of a, a robot that interacts with humans on a regular basis. But somehow it's going to have to gain the experience because it can't just read that. 
and, and, and fully interpret it? And, you know, at least, I don't think so. So I think there will be limits on how quickly it can evolve in certain areas. But in other areas, like, you know, designing compilers, I think it can probably learn to do that way better than yeah. humans pretty quickly. 100%. Interesting. Um, okay, I, I, I feel like we could go on a, a long tangent on that, and yeah, we should I have so many questions. But, but <laughs> I do want to get back to the plugins. So um, today, as of this recording, there are three native plugins, which maybe we can touch on a little bit. Um, the the first one being their web browser plugin. Um, I work for a newsletter company. We have a lot of content writing. Uh, something like this, where you're able to actually retrieve real-time information. Um, I think my question would be, am I about to replace all of the writers that work at, at Morning Brew? Um, or like, what sort of things might we be able to do with the web browser plugin? I don't know. I, I don't think so, um, but maybe. You yeah. know, certainly, I would say like ChatGPT 3.5 does not seem to write. Like, after you look at enough like ChatGPT 3.5 responses, yeah. it's pretty clear when you, like, you know it when you see it. What? I would say that people reviews. even, yeah, yeah, like Reddit now, I would say is, is full of ChatGPT <laughs> yeah, generated yeah. responses. Posts, yeah. And people are pretty quick to point out like that, you know, classic ChatGPT. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, it writes in a way that is almost like overly formal yeah. um, and not very conversational, not very... It doesn't. It doesn't really like connect to people the same way. It doesn't. Cut, it doesn't really have like a strong voice right. or a. Um, yeah, it doesn't have a voice that like really is brandable. Almost. It's. It's very, you know, very HR, very like buttoned up, yeah. and uh, you know, it can mimic other people's voices to a degree. But I don't know how much that can replace. You know, like Morning Brew goes for a specific style. Like they have somewhat of a voice. Yeah. Um, I. I think, you know, it could mimic that voice to a degree, but I don't know if it's going to be as good at picking out exactly what's most interesting and, like, writing it in that voice as humans would be. And uh, that could change. Yeah. I, you know, I haven't had a chance to play much with GPT or GPT-4. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how much better it's at. It is at that. There, I will say there is a skill in, like, learning what to write about. But uh, because this is this real-time API where I can get, you know, breaking news, say yeah. um, there was some massive news story, if I had my own custom model that was trained on, like, all of the stories that Morning Brew has ever written, uh, and then all I did with the web browser API was reach out for some new story and say, hey, write this in the Morning Brew voice, I'd be really curious to see, like, how well that worked. I've... I've Use ChatGPT Chat GPT today to try to build a Morning Brew story. It did not do well. But if you actually trained it on the data, uh, again, I'd be really curious to see exactly you know what that output would be like. Yeah, I think that is interesting. So yeah, instead of just giving it one article and asking it to uh, you know write that in ChatGPT, you know, giving it an example of, of a Morning Brew article and then yeah. giving it an example of a new article to summarize in, in uh, Morning Brew's voice to explicitly give it all of Morning all of those it, articles, right. and and then ask it to use that voice. I I'm also curious how yeah. well that would perform. I think um, it would be pretty interesting yeah. if uh, if it did. I do think Morning Brew is probably more susceptible than other types of companies like Morning Brew, Morning Brew, and any newsletter that is um, sort of I think the past like several years, maybe even the past like decade, has been defined by the creation of a lot of companies that like media companies in particular that uh, take existing. They're almost like middleware, like media middleware, mm -hmm. you know, they take, com they take stories from Synthesize Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, it, yeah. summarize it, reproduce it. Right. That might be something that Chad GPT, you know, like GPT just replaces. Yeah. But if then you talk about like the, I don't think it will replace the Wall Street Journal on the one end of that because the Wall Street Journal is actually Cuddly, cu cutting edge journalism. Like, exactly. Yeah. Like investigative journalism, right. like where you're actually on the ground talking to people, right. um, you know, getting those like human sources. Uh, I don't see ChatGPT replacing that in the mm -hmm. first. I mean, at least not until that there are you know prolific robots that can do those on the ground. I got to be honest. It really sounds sounds like you're uh, telling me I need to uh, shape up my resume a little bit. And <laughs> start, you know, start looking for something. Um, but no, I think like this this is uh, you know just one of the maybe many use cases that uh, this web browser API can be used for. Uh, it seems like maybe we're just kind of limited to our imagination and really whatever you know, you're interested in building with real-time data uh, or search results can, can be built with this. So uh, I do think that this is one of the more interesting native plugins that they've, they've chosen to build. 
Um, they have two others. I, I know we spoke about the retrieval uh, API a little bit. We didn't really have too many thoughts on that. Um, wasn't uh, fully understanding necessarily like the full scope of what that could do. Um, based on what I saw, it was really just, you know, you feed it your own data or maybe like file system and uh, yeah. you're able to kind of traverse that and, and search it and, you know, pull up maybe something you want. But I don't necessarily see the utility in that just yet. Yeah, I was also unclear about exactly what the scope is of the retrieval plugin. It looks, you know, looking at the code base on GitHub, it looks like it basically, um, it's like a classic vector search. Yeah. So you take, uh, you know, a set of documents and you chunk them up into pieces of text. I want to say it's like 200 characters, but that could be, maybe I'm totally misremembering that. Um, and then you, for each of those chunks of, let's say 200 characters, maybe it's something else, but uh, for argument's sake, let's say it's 200 characters. Yeah. Um, you map that into a smaller vector, um, and you know, using the I think it's like the text ADA text embedding yeah. model yeah, too from OpenAI, um, and then you take some query prompt, map that into a vector, and then you do an inner product measurement, basically a similarity comparison between those two vectors, mm -hmm. and you return the chunk that is the, the closest match. So it's yeah. basically, um, you know, it's a uh, it is ChatGPT, but it's uh, you know it's almost like it's almost a little bit old hat because it's uh, yeah. it's an older embedding model, right? Like you're basically just using this old uh, text data, you know, zero zero two embedding model that OpenAI has already had, just applying it to chunks of your own data, and then the the new part, I guess, is just the uh, encoding of the ChatGPT prompt into the vector. But I'm not sure if ChatGPT is doing that or if that's also being done through the embedding model. Like is, you know, is that embedding model just uh, again taking that prompt, turning it into a vector, or is ChatGPT generating some new piece, some new string, mm. which is then embedded? Yeah, well, I wonder if like the point is just to be maybe a more helpful or better search, because I, I think of something like a, you know, my notes app or Notion, like they all like all these apps they have search built in. And so is the idea maybe like I can just have more of like a fragmented data set uh, in one or what, you know, what exactly am I getting um, benefit wise out of this is, yeah, I'm not really sure. I think it's probably better than Notion. I would imagine you know, even if you just, you know, like let's say throw away chat GPT yeah. and just use the text ADA002 model, right, that embedding model. Yeah. If I just took that and then applied it to, you know, 200 character chunks of all my note, my, uh, Notion docs, yeah, and then you know was able to search. I took that query, embedded it also via the text data model, and then did a similarity search and, and pulled up what it returned. That would probably do better than what Notion currently uses. I'm not a fan of Notion, so I think there'd be a you know most <laughs> things would be better than their search for sure. But I do wonder. Yeah, I, I guess I'm, my main curiosity is on that one is just whether or not ChatGPT is actually doing anything. Like is right. ChatGPT yeah. translating your prompt into something else, which is then embedded, or is the embedding just done directly on that prompt and chat GPT is not really important to that. So we're kind of like uh, TBD on this yeah, to, to be determined exactly. on, on like exactly yep. what we what we feel about Hopefully that. eventually we'll get off the wait list exactly. and then uh, get to, to actually play yeah. with this. Which if you haven't gotten on the wait list yet, uh, definitely recommend you guys do so. So uh, the final one is the code interpreter. Now when I first saw this, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around it, but I would have thought, hey, I'm, I'm you know, showing it my code uh, and it is uh, just interpreting that and maybe telling me what errors there are, maybe uh, you know, some performance enhancements I can do, uh, all doing that in its own executable environment. I know it does have its own environment, but I, that doesn't seem to be exactly what it's doing. So do you know maybe a little bit more about the interpreter? I, so I was looking at the interpreter, and I think it's interesting. I, you know, I feel like it's almost a little bit deceptive to uh, advertise it as an interpreter. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't seem like you know there's limited examples that OpenAI provides for how it's used, but it seems like the primary one that they're pushing is for data visualization. Yeah. So it's almost like ChatGPT is trained on text. It knows how to take in text and generate text. It doesn't know how to generate plots. Mm. Um, you know, if you wanted to generate uh, a you know a visual output. It would be easy enough to pass GPT output into Dolly and then output an image. But if you want to generate a plot, like a, a rigorous plot, like a mathematical plot or a right. diagram where it's not sort of, um, you know, weird uh, hallucination effects <laughs> yeah. like Dolly, yeah. then ChatGPT doesn't really have a way to do that, even, you know, even if it did have access to Dolly. Mm -hmm. So I think the code interpreter is like, at least 
it seems like they're advertising it as basically a way to get around that. So let's say I want to plot a certain function, mathematical function, I can ask ChatGPT to plot that and to get an image, it will first generate, say, Python code, run that Python code through the built-in code interpreter, and then generate the plot. Okay. So I don't know if, um, I don't know the extent of what you can do beyond that. Like, to me, it seemed like when I heard code interpreter, the first thing I thought was, I ask ChatGPT all the time to generate code for me. Yeah. Um, often it's buggy and I have to pass it an error message, exactly. and then it gives me a revised code, and then I give it another error message, and it gives me another kind revised code. synthesize that down to, like, an actual answer, an actual... Exactly. So, like, the first thought that when I heard Code Interpreter was that, you know, you could ask it for a code, you know, ask it for a program that does something, it would generate it, test it, generate it, test it, iterate, yeah. continually debugging, right. and then on in one pass, instead of an N pass, it that would give, give me a final, final answer. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's currently possible with it. I don't think that's actually what it does. Right. Um, but that's what's frustrating about this is like we'd really love to get our hands on you know testing it and seeing the full extent of what it can do. But um, you know, not not available right now. Yeah, it's such a shame. All right. So now I want to ask you a question. Please. So you mentioned the other day that um, working at Morning Brew, you guys were trying to figure out ways to use GPT um, in your business. Yeah. Has anything interesting come of that? Yeah, so a few different things. We actually had a you know that retro meeting where uh, we we tried to brainstorm some ideas, and uh, in the presentation that my coworker gave, um, we had actually taken a, a video podcast of one of our influencers. Uh, her name's Money with Katie. She's got great yeah, information. <laughs> yeah, definitely go subscribe. Uh, but we took one of her video podcasts, and we took the audio from that podcast. Uh, we trained an AI model on that and um, they were able to generate a story based off of that. So it wasn't just the audio transcription of the story, but they actually took that and uh, formulated like an entire story based off of that podcast. Was this with GPT? That you took the audio I, transcript? And I, think then, like, it, I think it was GPT. I don't know exactly. Uh, there was a few different AI uh, technologies we were using. I, did, I wasn't the one that- Could have been barred. <laughs> it might have been. Uh, it might have been. Um, but so we, we made a story out of that. And then from that, we actually trained another AI model on her voice. So Katie's voice. And we took that. And I think it was only like five or 10 minutes worth of uh, audio. And this AI model was able to accurately play back the story that was just generated in her voice. That's so super interesting. It was, it was very cool. It was really uh, trippy to hear because it was there was no like latency there was no really it, yeah. didn't, it didn't have any weird like no audio it, artifacts it, it sounded exactly like her i've met what? her in person too and i was like am i listening to her right now future episodes exactly. Exactly. just AI. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but it was it was super cool and um you know that that presentation like really opened up my eyes as to exactly you know what was possible with this and made really you know I should have probably been in on it a little bit earlier, but really sold me on it and, and made me want to uh, go down this path. So um, there's a few other ideas we're kind of kicking around today at Morning Brew, uh, one of them being like SEO metadata generation. So uh, we have a, a CMS and uh, all of our stories are kind of in our back end. And uh, the thought process is, you know, we'll write out a story and then instead of us like having to think of SEO information like an SEO title or description or something like that, uh, we can actually just get ChatGPT or some other AI model to, um, you know, take that story and then generate SEO information and hopefully be better than you know what we could make. So uh, that's like one of them. Yeah, we have we have a lot of different ideas. But can you give me an example? Like what uh, what metadata are you trying to generate? So it would just be like like I'm sorry, like Google like metadata. What, what do you mean? Yeah, like like which uh, which elements on a page or like what exactly. Yeah, like a meta title, a meta description. So, like, if you okay, go gotcha. to uh, like a search result uh, and you look right. at like, yeah, you'll see like the title. So, and description so anything there. other than those two, like just meta title, meta description. Uh, I'm sure we're we're probably gonna uh, go with like alt text, uh, things like that gotcha. for for images and whatnot. But um, that's just like the kind of the basics. Like we we identified those as maybe like easy wins. I guess that's an interesting one to you now that GPT-4 can take images, so right. you can exactly. automatically generate all the old text. Has, exactly. Yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's like an idea, like a small business idea of, in of itself. Course, like, yeah. uh, something that automatically generate, like a WordPress plugin, a mm -hmm. paid WordPress plugin yep. that generates uh, alt text, SEO optimized alt yeah. text for images automatically. 
I don't know how much I'd be willing to pay that as a I'm business. Bloggers, request, I feel like a lot of bloggers true. would pay for that. But yeah, I like I, yeah, I, I think um, that, yeah, it would be a good business idea. And there's so many like little things that can be done today to like create maybe not like tens of millions or billion dollar ideas, but like you could become a millionaire off like a small idea that is helpful to a lot of people. So yeah. I think like the space that we're in right now is, you know, there's so much room for, for people to, to do something in it. And uh, it's the most interesting plugin idea you can think of right now. If you, oh, you come really up with something and like putting me on the spot. Yeah. Um, let's say, you know, you, you're, you're going to spend the next three days creating a plugin and launching it. What are you, uh, what are you going to create? You know, I don't know that I have anything that is super interesting. I think, um, you know, if I did, I wouldn't share it with you guys. <laughs> no, no. Um, I think, you know, my mind just goes to uh, whether it's like lead gen or, or uh, you know, chat support. Like, that's just really where my mind goes. And it's like an obvious answer. Um, but right, and another one that you won't share with them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I honestly, I, you know, I don't have too many... Um, like crazy ideas. I think it's one of those things where it's like, uh, there's so many choices that you just like have none <laughs> almost, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's just like, uh, there's just so much you can do. Overload. Exactly. Um, but no, I, yeah. What do you have any, any good ideas that honestly that, that, that little, uh, the, the, the like alt text generator, yeah. I feel like that's an interesting one. Um, I think there's so much around like content generation for like blogs and whatnot that you can do, uh, whether it's like literally writing stories for them or, you know, SEO, um, like I think like whole jobs are going to be lost, you know, f from this, right. Where it's like, why would I, why would I hire like an SEO contractor or anything like that when I could just click a button and have that all be written for me. Right. Maybe, I wonder how effective it will be though. Like I, I, I think this, to me, this is still like moderately unknown about yeah. how well this will work. I, I think, you know, it probably depends to a degree on the type of blog and the mm -hmm. type of content. Like if you are. Uh, producing sort of like, 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 first of all, I would say it's like something like Investopedia, right? Mm -hmm. That I think is unfortunately a, a blog, a, an information site right. that really has no moat um, to AI because it's all questions, right? It's just like define this term and explain briefly what it is. Yeah. That like you don't even need to go to the blog anymore. So if Investopedia could hire GPT, you know, it could use GPT to generate content, but someone could just ask GPT. So it's almost True. like a, you know, it's, it's like a little bit of just like you're capitalizing that legacy Google search, which will still be there for a while. Okay. So something else I like, and I would like to talk about with you is money. I like what, money. What do you think about money? You like it? Yep. Okay. Money is good. <laughs> so how do you think that chat GPT is going to monetize plugins? I think that's a, a kind of frustrating question, actually, because, you know, they, they haven't really released any information on that. So it's kind of hard to think about, like, yeah. what is a good business idea because you don't know how they're going to monetize it. Um, so I think, you know, can you have a paid plugin, for example, similar to a paid app, right? Like if I have um, a, a data company and I want to make that data available to chat GPT users, can I charge them, you know, a two dollar per month subscription to access mm. um, my data through chat GPT? I don't know if that'll be allowed or not. I would and, imagine that they're yeah. going to allow that. Because, uh, you know, they would be missing out on money as well, right? Because if yeah. we kind of liken this to Apple's App Store, where uh, the App Store, they take, I think, 30% yeah. of, of revenue. So, I mean, that's a, that's a massive revenue stream that they'd be missing out on if they didn't do something like that. Um, yeah, I would imagine that they will, too. I, I It's still, without knowing the percentage, it, you right. know, it's kind of like, will it be 10%, 30%, 50%? Yeah. Um, that constrains what uh, businesses are actually a good business idea. Mm -hmm. um, so that will be, I'm, I'm anxiously looking forward to whenever they release that information. Um, other than that, I think a clear revenue model for them would be lead gen. So you take a company like Expedia, right. um, Expedia you know, someone asks ChatGPT, hey, uh, I need to get a cheap flight to JFK this weekend. Um, they could then call an Expedia plugin and, you know, they could either generate you know, they, like a link for them. Exactly. Yeah, and that yeah. link could be an affiliate link. So they generate, you know, uh, revenue on commission. Yeah. It could be a uh, cost per click link. So every time someone clicks on it, they charge a percent or they charge, you know, a flat fee. It could be a cost per impression view. So every time someone asks a question and you serve up that Investopedia or that uh, Expedia link, um, you charge, you know, a few cents for that impression, regardless of whether or not they click on it. Yeah. In that sense, I think it's kind of sort of similar to uh, how Google monetizes. Right. Um, and, you know, I think also it would be interesting. I, I almost see like plugins could be 
sort of analogous to Google. Like Google has organic traffic, you know, organic search results, and also sponsored results. And I think you could basically have something similar with plugins because let's say, again, that I ask, um, hey, I want a cheap flight to JFK. There are many different travel aggregator sites that would like to be the plugin that's responded, you know, yeah. in that. And you could have a Google-like okay, auction right. yeah. to have, you know, that, you know, whichever uh, company mm -hmm. bids the most to serve up, uh, or you know, to have their link served up to be the plugin that that serves that request. That's very interesting. I, I guess Google kind of deals with the same thing already, but that feels a little bit scary just because of I, I could like bid something up and provide a ton of misinformation. If I really wanted to, you can do that on Google. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, like, they already do deal with it. But I guess the idea being, like, with ChatGPT, I'm supposedly getting a kind of single result that I, I trust. Yeah, that's true. versus you know a a list of, of different items I can go through. So that that's something I think that concerns me a little bit. Um, true. That's a that's a very good point. Actually, that's a you know that's a sort of conflict to something that interested me originally, like years ago in AI, was yeah. that you know if you took the sort of Google approach. Or, and, you know, like Google has tried to be, uh, you know, Google Assistant, Google yeah. Home, you have Alexa. And for a long time, you know, I, I was interested in AI because of the, you know, you need, a, you need a, almost a better business model. Like it, it does pose some fundamental like issues. If imagine, you know, if you're asking Alexa for relationship advice or like financial advice. Yeah, I hope you're not And then that. it also <laughs> is giving you... Uh, <laughs> You know, it, it's like, you know, what, what the best for your finances would be if you bought this thing on Amazon, right? To and you have the same issue here with ChatGPT, exactly. Yeah. Like, as people start to trust it, um, especially if they're using it for, you know, sort of like personal questions, and then they also just get these, like, single sponsored links, I do think that poses, like, a dangerous, you know, conflict of interest. Yeah. And, you know, in that respect, it, it would kind of be disappointing if OpenAI went down that route because will, their entire... Yeah thesis is to like make AI that benefits humanity yes. and hopefully not have all the same financial constraints as Google. It makes me feel a little bit comfortable that they maybe mention security and privacy like 30 times on like all of their documentation. They are, it And is yet they're not right. that private, right? There was some instance, someone on Twitter I think yeah. posted a screenshot of um, an instance where they were accidentally logged into someone else's account, so all of the, the chat threads oh, on yeah, the side were somebody else's. Well. well, I mean, you can you can make mistakes, right? Like you do want to be as private and as secure as possible. But also, uh, like those two things, right? I, like I would say, you know, they talk about it, but how much do they take action on it? Fair. Not necessarily. I mean, maybe it's equivalent to what Google is doing. But also, even if they did those perfectly, you still have the like conflict of interest issue, which is, I think is like a totally separate issue. Like you can mm -hmm. be completely private and secure. And still have major conflicts of interest where you're serving up, um, you know, single search results or single results uh, in a in a very trusted environment. And I don't really know how they're going to approach that. Interesting. Uh, yeah, that, I feel like that is a, a deeper topic that we can get into. But I do want to get back to the kind of financials of what plugins yeah. might be. And so, do you think there's two kind of final questions I want to ask you? Um, do you think that I, as a plugin developer, will have much say over how I'm able to monetize my customers? So, for instance, am I able to choose, hey, you know, if someone's using my plugin, it's going to be free, but it's really going to be on a per-use basis. So, anytime they're using my plugin, uh, that might be a per-query or per-token type of expense for them. Or, do you see ChatGPT, they want kind of to go the Google route, where it, as the end user, it's always going to be free for me. Um, but you know, I'm able to monetize as a plugin or business in some other manner that I might not have much say over. I really have no idea. I think uh, you know, it, a lot of it will depend on how much OpenAI considers the conflict of interest issue when they're coming up with their monetization policy. Yeah. Because they again, like if they were a for-profit company and we're not concerned with the ethics, I think they would just take the Google route and say, uh, you know, we're going to take sponsored plugin response. You know, we're going to. We're going to respond to queries with sponsored plugins when there's a sponsored plugin that will pay us enough money. Um, we'll also allow paid plugins and do an app, uh, Apple Store like revenue share, um, and those two things together make up a pretty great business. Yeah. Maybe they'll put some constraints on that um, based on you know trying to balance the conflict of issue and their uh, their their charter of trying to create yeah. AI that benefits all humanity. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of it will just depend on that, like how much they're they're balancing those, you know, the financially optimal result with the uh, 
their ethical charter. Yeah, I don't envy the position that they're in, or you know, they're also going to be very wealthy, so maybe I do. But <laughs> uh, it's it's very challenging to kind of weigh those two things, right? Where you're you want to build something ethically, but also you're kind of a, I think it's a capped profit business, so they are like for profit at this point, but not. Yeah, it's an interesting structure. Like, so their OpenAI originally was created as a nonprofit, right. and that entity still exists. It was just renamed. Mm -hmm. um, it's, so it's usually now referred to as OpenAI nonprofit. Mm -hmm. uh, at least that's how they refer to it internally. Um, I think the, the business entity name is just OpenAI Inc. Mm. And then there is OpenAI LP, Limited Partnership, which is a capped profit company that the OpenAI Inc., the nonprofit, is the general partner of OpenAI LP. And OpenAI LP, yeah is the one that's capped at 100 times profit. So after that, all revenue goes to the general partner, which is the nonprofit. Before that, it's split amongst the limited partners of the LP, which are employees and certain investors like Microsoft. Okay, so what are some of the initiatives uh, that you're, you might be aware of that the nonprofit would be doing with that excess cash flow? No idea, really. I mean, I think the, the idea would be to use the excess cash flow in other AI endeavors, mm -hmm. um, but definitely like LP is the main thing that they're focused on right now. This might be a very uh, nebulous question, and I know I, I said I only had two for you, but it, it's kind of um, sparking my, my brain a little bit. Um, but say uh, AI in general and, and open AI, they take out a lot of jobs and, and leave people jobless. Uh, I know the topic of, of UBI is, is something that's been talked about a little bit, but do you see maybe the excess profits uh, from OpenAI, the, the uh, LLC, or incorporated, um, rolling over to the nonprofit uh, being set up for some like, uh, you know, UBI type income? Can maybe. I, I think, happen? you know, like it would be legally, I don't know quite how that would work. Mm -hmm. Like it, it seems sort of, uh, you know, from an engineering perspective, it seems like that could be a, a, a type of route. Um, I that's probably not how it'll happen. Yeah. At least not, you know. Like our legal system doesn't focus specifically on single companies. So if something like that happened, it would have to be part of a broad reform that, you know, like I think you know Bill Gates has advocated putting a tax on robots. Yeah. Like basically, like that sort of idea. It's not really practical right now. But if it gets to a point where AI and or robotics like starts replacing a, a lot of jobs. Mm -hmm. Maybe that is what you do, um, in which case I think that will affect yeah basically every company. Every, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so I know I, again I know that was uh, kind of out there, but just something I had on my mind. And that's a wrap. <laughs>